first to note is that we are recording this webinar and we'll send this out to all the attendees uh, after the webinar as soon as it's ready. Also, uh, we have saved some time at the end for questions. So uh, at any point during the presentation, if you have a question, uh, please feel free to uh, type the question in the, the chat box and we will address those at the end. Really excited to, to have Joy with us today. Uh, and with that, I'll turn it away. Go, turn it over to you, Joy. Go ahead and take it away. Great. Thank you, Andy. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm very excited to be able to share some information and hopefully some wisdom about project management theory. So my goal is to give you a good overview of the formal project management components as identified by the Project Management Institute, which is really the preeminent organization for project management across the world. And um, I also hope to give you a little bit of an insider's view of what makes a good project manager, and we'll make sure to give you some resources. So I'll give you a bit of background on myself. So I'm an independent consultant, and I provide strategy implementation services to deans, typically that have a strategic plan, but need a little bit of support in implementing it effectively. I also serve as a strategy specialist for the Center for Industrial Research and Service at Iowa State University, and I provide strategy services to manufacturing leaders across the state of Iowa. I have 20 years of experience in corporate and academic roles, and I've been certified as a project manager, um, a project management professional through PMI for 11 years. So let's get right into it. So project management. The agenda for today is to define what project management is and also what it is not, to walk through project management process groups, which I don't expect you to know what that is yet, but you will soon, share project management knowledge areas, review resources. So I'm going to be going really quickly through this information, but there are going to be plenty of resources at the end where you'll be able to refer to get more information and dive deeply into whatever area you feel you need some extra special care in. And then finally, we'll have questions and answers. That's actually the part where I think we'll get the juiciest input and um, it'll matter the most to you. So I'm going to go again pretty quickly through these slides. You will receive a recording after this is completed. So my intention is that you would be able to go back and review the things that you want to understand in more detail. So there's a lot of text, a lot of pictures that you'll probably want to know more about, but I'll be just jumping right through them um, and then assuming that you'll go back and look at them later. So the first thing on our agenda is just to find project management. So how do you even know if it is a project? What distinguishes between your day-to-day -day job and a formal project? Basically, if it's temporary and it ends and it has a unique result that's expected at the end, then it's a project. So when I say it's temporary and it ends, if it's something that you do on a day-to-day -day basis that's just ongoing, so maybe you're a social media coordinator for your college, and so you go out and you take photos and you get videos and you go out to Facebook and LinkedIn and you post things for your school and you link to other sites. That all is part of your day-to-day -day activities and it's something that you just do on an ongoing basis. It wouldn't be considered a project. It doesn't ever end. But if it's, for instance, creating a social media strategy, that's something that is a unique project. It has a start date and it has hopefully an end date and it's going to be something that you'll need to do a lot of tasks in order to understand how do I do my social media marketing strategy, who needs the information, who needs to be included up front and telling me what it should look like, and how do I know that I'm doing it correctly. All of those are things that are unique to that particular project, and you probably won't be repeating it over and over again. So again, just a visual to help you remember that a project is a project if it begins and it finishes and it has a unique result. Okay, so that's the Project Management Institute kind of definition, but I would love to share with you what I think project management really is. Project management to me is all about power. In an organization, there is power that needs to be harnessed and channeled, and the right people need to know the right things at the right time. And this has everything to do with authority and accountability. 
So if you think about the things that have gone wrong on projects that you've done in the past or the things that have gone right, oftentimes it has something to do with communicating the right things to the right people at the right time. So I'm going to actually define project management in my own terms as great, uh, just to say great project managers harness and channel power in an organization to get the right information and resources to the right people at the right time in the right way in order to remove barriers and get the right things done. So it really is all about and when I say channel power, I'm not talking about any kind of new age channeling of power. I'm talking about making sure that you're creating the right channels of communication within the organization. So you're channeling the power through communication to make sure that everything is getting done correctly by the right people at the right time and in the right way. Okay, so now back to the fundamentals of project management as defined by PMI. And I will go ahead and bring in some of that power, accountability, authority as we go through. But um, we'll dig a little bit into the details of what project management is. So first, um, I'm certainly biased when it comes to strategy as being really important. But to me, the most important thing for an organization is to have a really clear strategy of where the organization is going overall. Once you know what the overarching goals are for the organization, including the measures of success for those strategies, then you can effectively identify what the right projects are within the organization, what the right measures of success are for each of those projects, and what timeframes you need to bring those projects in under in order to meet the goals of the organization at large. So if you have leaders in the organization that haven't clearly articulated what the strategy of the organization is, it's going to be very challenging for you to be able to align all of your efforts on a day-to-day -day basis to ensure that those strategies are done. In fact, it's going to be impossible. So in the terms of power that we mentioned earlier, power is about understanding what is expected at the top of your organization, and once that high level strategy has been identified, then all of the leaders are, you know, assumedly behind that. And that gives the people that are basically executing that strategy a great deal of power in the organization. Without that kind of power, it is very hard to get your projects completed. In fact, I think you might even need to question whether you're doing the right projects and whether you're achieving the right measures of success. But let's just assume that you have a great project in place, I'm sorry, a great strategy in place for your organization, and that allows you to align your project to that strategy, and then you're ready to go with project management. So the example I'm going to use is building a house. Um, it's a good example of a project. Everybody understands what building a house entails, and you can apply this to anything, whether it's an academia or your personal life, but a project is a project is a project. So the first thing that you want to do in a project is build your plans. You want to make sure that you understand the blueprint so that you understand what you're going to do in terms of project management implementation. Walk through project management process groups. So project management process groups is, a, again, a project management institute term for um, basically the stages of a project. So in order to effectively manage a project, you first have to be sure that you have the authority to start it, which means that you have the resources in place and you have the authority to utilize those resources appropriately. That's initiating. Planning is taking the approval to move forward with the project and actually do all the planning. So creating the blueprints and making sure that all the right people are on board to tell you what their role in implementing the project is going to be. That's where you do all of your research and identify all of the steps that are going to be needed in order to get to your end goal effectively. Executing is, at its simplest level, just create, um, actually implementing the plan. And then monitoring and controlling is um, the process group where you look at how you're executing, monitor how you're executing, and determine if there are areas that need to be adjusted or controlled in order to get back on track with the project. So monitoring and control is just a way of keeping track of how things are going and making sure that things are still on track. 
And five, um, closing. This is one of my very favorite process groups, mainly because it's a way to continuously improve. So the closing is where you look back at the project and determine what you did well and what you could have done better and use those learnings as a way to improve your future performance. So this is just a bit of a timeline to give you a sense for how the process groups flow. First of all, of course, initiating is the first process group, and then that flows into planning, planning flows into executing, executing into managing and controlling, and then finally closing. So it looks really simple and easy, but as you know, it never turns out quite like this. Wouldn't it be lovely if we all had plenty of time to just set aside a year to plan for some really complex project? As you know, it usually doesn't work out like that. So typically we're initiating and sometimes we're asked to jump in and start planning even though we don't necessarily have everything from the initiating stage completed. And planning is starting when we you know, need to start executing on that plan. And while we're executing, of course, we need to manage and control, but we're still planning some things, maybe even initiating. And then finally closing would be after everything is complete. So this gives you a sense for what the flow is, but not necessarily, um, they aren't necessarily this, this nice and distinguished. So just a little bit more about the initiating process group. So I mentioned that this is where you get permission to move forward with the project. This is an area where you're going through ideation stage and you're brainstorming with anybody that matters in the project. And the people that matter in a project are called stakeholders. So this could be people that you report to, your supervisors, it could be senior leaders in the organization, it could be your peers, it could be the people that are actually going to be doing the work, perhaps you're going to be doing all or some of the work. And it's um, working with you know, the people in the quality organization, making sure that you're getting enough very, very high level basic um, ideas about what this project should look like and what the measures of success are going to be so that you can then take that with the costs and the benefits to your manager and ask if this is a project that should be embarked upon. And if your manager or the senior leaders in the organization determine that yes, indeed, the benefits outweigh the costs and they're going to give you the power or the authority and the accountability to create this project and get it off the ground, then you have initiated your project, you get a project um, basically approval, and typically at this stage is where you would create a project charter. And if you just Google project charter, you'll find thousands of different templates, but it's a very basic document that basically says, this is what this project is supposed to look like, do we all agree? And how am I going to be held accountable? Who's gonna be held accountable? Everybody signs off on it and off you go. That project charter gives you permission to spend money. It gives you permission to gather other resources in the organization that may be prioritized on other projects. It gives you permission to reprioritize others' efforts as appropriate. So it's, it's a way of giving you power as a project manager to say, I've actually been given the authority and accountability to make sure that this project gets done. Therefore, I'm gonna step into that power and I'm going to be sure that I behave in the organization as though I have that power. So it's uh, taking responsibility that you are acting on management's behalf um, and you are going to move through the organization and make sure that you have all the information you need from everybody to meet management's expectations. So initiating is about figuring out, okay, what do you really want? So this is, you know, I need to know what you're asking for. What kind of requirements do you want for this project? It's getting a go from your leadership to make sure they say, yes, you can go. Or in some cases, and this is really great news, if you ever get this, that means that you did a great job in the initiation because you gathered the right information and you were able to share with management that it's really not a good investment for you to move forward with this project at this time. So uh, it's called a go, no go decision. And it's really just as well to get a no go decision as it is to get a go decision because in the initiating stage, before you've been given approval, power for the project lies with the senior management. It does not lie with the project manager until the project charter is signed 
and everybody has agreed to the parameters of the project. So at this point, if they say, nope, we don't want to spend the money or we feel like your time is going to be better spent elsewhere, everybody should be celebrating because now you're actually prioritizing the things that are most important in the organization as opposed to just doing projects willy-nilly because it feels like a thing to do. So this is happy customers uh, making sure that in the initiating stage, you understand exactly what's going to make them happy and documenting it effectively uh, accordingly and then making sure that you get the appropriate sign-offs. At this point, the project charter is signed and the power is turned over to, in the case of building a house, it would be turned over to the general contractor. In your case, it's gonna be turned over from your management to you to give you permission and power and authority to move forward with project management. A certain amount of power, in fact, a great deal of power, stays with the customer, or in your case, it would be with your management. You want to make sure that the power for making decisions about whether or not you should spend more money than was expected on the project or bring in more resources, that power needs to stay with management, but you have the power to bring challenges or changes to their attention to request those changes. So again, just thinking of project management and a great project manager as one who channels the power and the resources in an organization effectively. The next stage, the process group is planning, and this is where, like blueprints for building a home, you're talking to the right people to understand exactly what their needs are. So for a social media marketing strategy, this would be talking to different departments within your college. It would be talking to the dean of your college. It would be talking to the people that are going to be on the project that are going to be actually executing the work. So you want to make sure that for building a home, you understand exactly how many bedrooms, you want to understand what the quality of the home is going to be because that directly affects your costs. You want to understand what the timeline is and make sure that you can pull the quality and the cost in during that uh, within that timeline. But all of that takes a lot of forethought, a lot of planning, and you need to make sure that the right people are at the table to have those conversations. Executing, again, this is just making sure that that blueprint that was created actually gets built. So that's this is really a matter of harnessing power within, in the organization in terms of checking in with people that have agreed to be accountable for particular tasks and making sure that they have the resources and the time that they need in order to accomplish those tasks. So in this case, your power is in being a project manager with the authority to either provide resources as necessary to get the project done or go back to management to request additional resources when they weren't provided up front or maybe not recognized up front. Monitoring and controlling, again, this is when you're going out and inspecting what's being done. This might be where some software testing comes in. This might be where if you have your social media strategy draft, um, you know, completed and you've started to do a little bit of the implementation, you're checking in with the folks that are going to be looking at the social media that you're uh, managing and saying, are we doing this the right way? Are these the different sites that you want to be included? You know, just kind of testing out, is, is this what we plan to do? And if not, do we need to make some adjustments to the plan or do we need to make some adjustments to our activities in order to bring it into the plan? And finally, closing, again, this is just where you look at everything that was done in those other stages of the project and consider whether you can improve upon those activities in the future projects that you manage. Now we've come to the next part of our agenda, which is to talk about project management knowledge areas. So the process groups, I'm just going to put this in context for you because this is really what the project management professional certification is based on, is these two different areas. The first thing is the process groups, which gives you a sense for what happens first in a project, what happens second in a project at a really high level, basically the phases of a project. What we're going to dive into now are called the knowledge areas. And these knowledge areas are going to be pieces of a project, components of a project, that are going to be brought into the project at all different phases of the project. So these different knowledge areas can be pulled upon throughout the entire life cycle of the project, even though they may be focused on more one or the other. But if you do decide that you might want to go for what's called a PMP certification, which I would highly encourage if you're interested in project management as a career path, Project management certification is a test that you can take and you would have to do a lot of studying up front, 
that that um, studying would be benefited by looking at these two areas and how they intersect with each other. And I have resources at the end of this um, presentation about the PMBOK, and you'll want to refer to some matrices that they have there that tell you exactly how they overlap. But for our purposes today, I'll just go into a high-level overview of what these knowledge areas are and just give you a sense for how they apply to projects. I do want to say one other thing here briefly, and that is that this is not new to you. All of you know exactly what I'm saying. I mean, you're gonna, this is all gonna be like, oh yeah, I already knew that. And the great thing about that is it really is simple. Project management really is simple at its core. And being able to just put the different components of project management into different buckets will help you to be more proficient and articulate as project manager as you move through the different phases of your project so that you can basically say, okay, now I need to look at this knowledge area. I need to look at that knowledge area. It will help you to organize yourself and the organization to get the project done. So what are the knowledge areas? The knowledge areas are integration management. So I am gonna actually tell you what they're called in the, the PMP. Project integration management, project scope management, project time management, project cost management, project quality management, project human resource management, project communications management, project risk management, project procurement management, and project stakeholders management. So even just going through this list, I bet you have a good feeling for what all of these things entail, and your gut feeling is in most cases going to be correct. It's really quite intuitive. So integration management is the one piece that I think wasn't intuitive to me when I started learning about what formal project management is. So I'm going to take just a moment here to explain it. All of the different areas of project management, all of these different knowledge areas, informal project management for complex projects, a great project manager would have a formal plan for each of those knowledge areas. All of those plans end up being an awful lot of documents, whether digital or on paper, it's a lot of information to, know, uh, to manage. So one extremely, in fact, it might be the most important role of a project manager is to manage all of those different components in a way that coalesces into effective project management. So if there's an area that I think might drive most people crazy as informal project managers without knowing these different components, is that they're just, you're constantly juggling time management, you're constantly managing the cost, you're constantly managing the resources, you're constantly managing status reporting to your boss and getting information, researching, benchmarking, trying to figure out what everybody's expectations are, documenting them, but not exactly sure how to document them, not knowing who's supposed to sign off on what, or maybe not even having a formal structure within the organization to sign off on anything. As a project manager, if you do pursue your PMP certification, what you'll find is that you start understanding these buckets in sort of rote memory, and you start understanding, oh, this goes in this bucket, this goes in that bucket. And so with that knowledge comes power, and you're able to understand the whole scope, the whole um, landscape of the project at any given point in time. And if you don't have it at the tip of your tongue or at the top of your mind, you certainly know where to get the information. And your job is to keep that information organized and keep everybody abreast of what that information is so that you can get the right information to the right people at the right time to get the right things done on the project. So integration management really is just that discipline of making sure that everything is in its right place, that you know where to go to refer to the details that plug into that larger project. And again, if you have the resources, which honestly, I'm assuming most of you don't. So in an academic environment where you're in a, a marketing component of a college or at a university, it's not likely in my experience that you'll have a tremendous amount of time to pull all of these pieces together and to create formal plans. So for whatever it's worth, I'm giving you complete permission to curtail these, um, all of these documents that I'm gonna be showing you here in a moment. All of these are for your use. You harness them, you um, truncate them, utilize them or not, but just knowing that they're there and that if you did have all the time in the world, 
you would be able to create these formal plans, I think will be helpful for you to understand at least the, the, big, the big weight that you have on your shoulders of managing a comprehensive project. So the most important part of integration management is a project management plan. So again, the formal plan is um, this plan contains all of the other plans within it, or at least points to all of the other plans. And I'm going to take a moment just to give a shout out to projectmanagementdocs.com. They have amazing templates available for you for free, and you would be very well served to just spend an hour or two out there just pouring through those documents and downloading them, playing around with them. But all of these documents that I have included here as screenshots are available to you at that location. So here's the project management plan. And the overview um, and the table of contents, basically, I'm not going to go through each part of it, but you'll see that every part, um, every knowledge area is touched on in the project management plan and then some. So this project management plan is just an example. Certainly, you need to tailor it to your organization. There's no right way to do a project management plan. But if you were going to do it comprehensively, you would have all of these components, potentially more, in it. And I will go into a little bit more detail here in each one. So here's um, another screenshot just to give you a sense for what kind of language goes into the introduction of this document. And then now we're to scope management. Scope management, here I have post-its with I want, I want, I want, I need this, I don't need that. This is really the discipline of understanding what needs and requirements there are for the project to be done successfully. So scope management is understanding what the features and functions and qualities of your end result need to be in order to satisfy your customer whether that's a customer that's actually paying you to do a project. Well, I guess if your, your boss is paying you to do a project just through your salary, you want to make sure that you understand what their expectations are so that at the end of the project, you get the satisfaction of being able to say, I met your expectations and here is, here's how. So here's some language about what's expected within a project scope document as a component of the project management plan. So I'm going to jump now to time management. Time management is all about scheduling. So it's um, in terms of power, as we mentioned, it's understanding how quickly things need to be, be done and knowing if you have the resources to get it done within that time frame. So I'll let you read through this at your leisure. This is just an example of a very high level milestone list that says, by this time we'll accomplish this, by this time we'll accomplish this. So this is a very rudimentary and basic project schedule. Cost management. So cost management, of course, is just understanding exactly what it's going to cost to get your project completed. And typically, this does not include uh, people's salaries, but it would include things like, um, well, we're going to need to bring in catering for whatever event as we meet with our stakeholders to identify what the scope is for this project. And so that gets added to your project cost. Here's an example of the cost management plan component of the project management plan. Here's a cost baseline template, which basically says during these phases of my project, I'm going to have to spend this much money. And here are the comments that include perhaps the assumptions that went into the amount of money that you're recommending as a budget in total. Quality management. So this really is like I was talking about with monitoring and controlling. This is about inspecting, making sure that the quality of your end product is going to meet the needs of your customers and your stakeholders. So this quality management plan talks about um, who's responsible for ensuring the quality is worked into the process. Um, what are the different quality specialists that are going to be included? So again, as marketing professionals in academia, my assumption is that you don't have um, tremendous quality resources available to you, except perhaps an exception would be if you're managing the software aspect of quality, um, that you would have IT resources available to you. But this is where you want to make sure that you understand um, what the quality expectations are and who's going to be meeting those expectations. Here is just a, a sample of the way that you would identify exactly what the expectations are for quality on the project. Human resource management. 
This is about making sure that you have the right staffing in place to get the job done. So this example happens to talk about the project manager, you have a senior programmer, you have a programmer, and then making sure that you just outline what their responsibilities will be on this project. A resource calendar is also brought into play for human resource management. Um, this also supports what you need for time management to determine how long your schedule is going to be. You have to make sure that you have the right people in place to contribute to that schedule. So if you only have one person to do the work of three people, then you're going to need to extend the length of your project. And this brings me again to the power um, component of project management. If your boss has asked you to complete a project and asked you to do it in a certain time frame with you know, only you, and as you get into the project, things that none of you could have predicted prove to you that you're going to need more resources in order to bring the project in in this, the predetermined time frame. If you realize you're going to need more resources, that is not something that you need to take responsibility for. You don't need to feel bad about it. It's not something that shows badly on you at all. What would show badly on you is if you didn't let your manager know that there has been an adjustment to expectations and you need to reconsider together what the plan is going to be going forward. So the conversation goes something like, you know, I realize now that we need two resources instead of just one myself in order to bring it in on time. And I know that you would like us to bring it in on time. So would you prefer that we bring in a temporary or transfer someone else from another project? Or would you prefer that we just go ahead and push out the time expectation? And having a resource calendar like this, although not necessary, certainly does give you power in your conversation with your manager to help them understand what's realistic and what's not realistic. Communications management is the process of explaining exactly what communication will be needed throughout the life cycle of the project. So everybody knows that you're going to have to communicate about a project when it's underway, but people don't necessarily allocate time for you. They just assume that, well, Becky's going to come and knock on my door whenever she needs me. And that's wonderful. They have wonderful intentions because they certainly want to be available to you, but it puts the project manager oftentimes at a disadvantage. So again, in the spirit of harnessing the power that you've been given by the managers that have approved your project, your role is to make sure that everybody agrees to the communications expectations up front so that you can use your power to ensure that those expectations are met. So what does that mean? Here's an example of a communications matrix. A communi and it, this, this proves to be extremely helpful. Even if all you do is get everybody on the project in a room together just to make this matrix, honestly, even if you never take the time to pull it out again, it'll make your job easier because everyone has agreed that we need a weekly status report. They agree that we need a weekly project team meeting. They agree that we need a project monthly review, project gate reviews if you're um, doing more of a technical project, and then again, a technical design review if it's a technical project. So again, there's no right or wrong. You can add things, take things away, feel free to Google and try and you know understand what other companies, what other organizations, what other schools have done in order to effectively develop communication matrices. But this is a really good, very simple example of what kind of communication is expected by the team to make sure that this project gets off well and continues well until the end project is, uh, end product is created. So the columns, communication type, the description of what that is, are we meeting via email, via Skype, are we going to be meeting in a particular conference room, what's the frequency, what's the format, participants, and what's the deliverable. So out of the weekly status report, you need to make sure that you have created a status report ahead of time and that you've distributed to all of this, uh, the meeting participants ahead of time and the owner of that is going to be you. So making sure that everybody understands what the communication is expected and that they agree to it up front so that it makes your job really easy to um, facilitate that communication. Risk management. So risk management is really about understanding what could possibly go wrong. In formal project management at the beginning of a project, when you've gotten approval and everybody's you know, created the plan and now you're ready to execute, just before you execute 
or at some stage in the planning, you want to make sure that you consider what could possibly go wrong. You know, things like, well, I know that we could have a tornado. Well, that's true, but we probably want to accept that risk since there's not much we can do about it. Um, that could wipe out our files, etc. But maybe it's important enough that you don't, you really, really need to make sure that your files are safe. So that risk could be something that you take precautions to be sure you have appropriate backups or you've moved to the cloud or what have you. So looking at all the different risks that could occur on your project and creating mitigation plans together before the, uh, before things go bad is really, really helpful. And then people know what to do when things do go bad. So here's an example of a risk management plan, again, as a component of your project management plan. Your risk management plan outlines what the risks are, what the impact is of those risks, and what the potential costs would be if those risks were realized. That helps people to make decisions about whether or not the risks should be mitigated and to what extent. There is a cost just to planning for risk mitigation, so you do want to be careful with that. Um, a risk register, I don't have an example here, but I would encourage you to look online if this is of interest. It gives you a formal way to track exactly what the quantitative impact would be of risks. Procurement management is what it sounds like, making sure that you're managing to bring the right resources into the project at the right time. So if you're building a house, this would be making sure that the right contractors were in place, that the wood was there when you needed to build the frame, that you have the drywall there at the right time, um, making sure that you have the appropriate resources for the, at the right time. So here's a procurement management plan, talks about who's going to do it and how. And then stakeholder management. So stakeholder management is a discipline. This is a final knowledge area, just to let you know. Um, stakeholder management is a discipline that is um, basically making sure that you've got the right people communicating at the right time, that you're understanding what their expectations are, that you're having stakeholder meetings as appropriate. So the reality is um, stakeholder management was just added to the PMBOK in 2013. It wasn't a formal separate uh, knowledge area on its own. It was just sort of peppered in throughout the other knowledge areas. So communication management was um, taken into account uh, communicating with your stakeholders, etc. But it is such an important part of project management that PMI decided to pull it out as its own unique knowledge area. So that brings us to reviewing our resources. I'm going to go through this very quickly so that we have a little bit of time for questions. And then at the end of the uh, presentation and the end of our webinar, you'll also be given an evaluation. I just want to make sure I make a plug here for that evaluation. Any feedback that you can provide about how um, this went, what value it provided to you, or the things that we could do to make future webinars better is extremely, extremely helpful to us. So please do take just a few minutes and we'll try and leave uh, just a few minutes at the end for you to do that. So reviewing resources. Um, I took the slant that you're going to want to get your PMP certification just so that you have all of the information at your disposal in order to pursue that path. So here is a page on the Project Management Institute, the Project Management Body of Knowledge, or the PMBOK, and what it means to be a PMI member, um, what the, PMI, the PMP exam costs, what it's kind of about. All of this information is, avail is available at PMI.org. Um, but I do want to make one uh, comment about PMI membership. It's $139 a year. You don't have to be pursuing, you don't have to have your PMP certification to be a member. But I would highly recommend that if you have the resources in your organization to request this as a professional development resource, there are so many incredibly rich um, templates and tools available to you. Chances are you're going to get so much benefit from being able to download free templates that are of utmost quality and free training that is going to, you know, really advance your knowledge in areas that um, you may not be able to get training on otherwise. It's very much worth the investment in my opinion. Um, this is actually my favorite little project management book, What You Need to Know About Project Management. It's just so easy, it's um, very accessible, and it really does give a lot of really great examples. Um, getting the Right Things Done is a tool. It overviews the A3 tool, which is a lean methodology, that it's basically just a project management methodology for getting all of the 
stakeholders on your project on board. So um, even if you don't have the resources to buy this fairly expensive book, it's a great book though, great visuals. Um, I would recommend that you go out on the web and just search for A3. Um, and you'll get lots of examples of how to complete um, a project management template. It's basically like a project management plan distilled down into one eight and a half by 11 or 11 by 17 document. Project Management 26 Game Changing PM Tools. This is um, a great book. It's only $3 on Amazon, and it outlines lots of different project management software packages, uh, the purpose of the software, the features, and the prices. Workfront Software is a leading um, version of software specifically for marketers to manage projects. It's highly rated. There's scheduling, proof advancement, resource management. It's got probably anything that you would need. Um, but it's not inexpensive, so it might be just something for you to be aware of. Standardmethod.net is a free resource that gives the structure for learning the PMBOK. So if you do decide to study for your PMP or just want a good reference, you can go out and look at this. Um, it'll give you just really good visuals for understanding how all the pieces of project management fit together. Um, this pro uh, a few articles I wanted to provide. What marketing experts can learn from project management pros. It's a Forbes very um, current. It was September 6, 2014. It's a great article. 14 project management tools for marketing agencies, also a terrific article. And then one more plug for projectmanagementdocs.com. Um, incredible resource for you. Free project management templates. So projectmanagementdocs.com. Finally, um, my contact information, you can find me on my website at joydonaldconsulting.com or my email address is joydonald at joydonaldconsulting.com and there's Andy's picture. Um, and then finally, we come to the question and answer portion. So I'll go ahead and turn it over to Andy to get your questions and I'll give the answers. Okay. All right, everybody, um, uh, just uh, give Joy a minute here to take a drink and Catch your breath. If you have any questions, we'd uh, love to hear them. Um, please type them into the, the chat box and we can start taking those now. Um, Joy, one of the questions that I like to hear or you know, get the um, opinion of is uh, what is one of those things that uh, you wish you would have known um, early on in your career managing projects that you, uh, that you didn't know that you know now? I think it's actually related to this idea of power. Um, when you're just starting out in project management uh, and learning, you know, all these different components, there really is an awful lot to know and it's swimming around, it was swimming around in my head. Um, so trying to learn that at the same time that I was just beginning my career and not really feeling comfortable in my own skin and recognizing that the only reason that I'm managing a project is because my superiors want to be able to get more work done. They don't, they can't do it themselves. So they are hiring people that they consider to be smart and competent, and they're going to give you the resources. They expect you to ask for resources. They expect you to make mistakes. They expect you to bump into barriers. And it's not your job to move those barriers aside. I didn't realize that. I think I spent a lot of too much time just turning around with guilt in my head that, oh, no, this went wrong on my project, and I can't believe that this went wrong, and spent countless nights trying to fix things that I never could have predicted in the first place. So maybe just as a matter of personal sanity, um, I'd love other people to learn from my mistakes and recognize that so much of that really isn't your responsibility. Your job as a great project manager is just to recognize when things do go wrong or when you bump into barriers and simply go back to the people that authorized the project in the first place and ask them to remove the barrier for you or to extend the life of the project give you more resources, whatever it is, but that's that really lies firmly on the shoulders of the people that asked you to do the project. I had a question about um, the, the certification. Can you talk a little bit more about the, the PMP certification, and specifically is it an, an online certification was the question? Sure. Um, so the exam is, um, I, when I took the exam, it was 11 years ago, so an awful lot of technology advancement has occurred since then. Um, I went to a center to um, sit down at a computer and take it on that location. I don't know if perhaps they've um, 
taken that constraint away and you can actually do it from your own computer. But at that time, for security reasons, um, I went to a center about an hour away and sat down. I took the, P uh, the PMP exam. It was a four hour exam and still is. Um, and it has 200 multiple choice questions. So um, it's really, I guess, the only thing I would say about it, um, unless there are other questions I'd be happy to field, is that it it really is um, not, it's not necessarily intuitive. So the big concepts that I shared with you today are very intuitive, but even if you've managed projects for decades, going in and taking the PMP exam wouldn't be a good idea without some um, study in the in the PIM block. Um, there, and, and probably even taking a course, whether online or in person, to um, improve your knowledge of exactly what these little definitions are. And, you know, and there's a lot of formulas involved um, with certain aspects of scheduling. Uh, it, it really does get into some pretty nitty gritty things that you want to study in depth. So I would just say um, don't be overconfident at the intuitive nature of these high level concepts. Make sure that you give yourself the time to study appropriately. Sure, we've had a couple of questions about uh, managing projects and marketing projects as opposed to capital projects and uh, project management certification for people working on marketing projects. Can you, can you talk about how PMBOK might be beneficial or helpful for to, to those people who are working on marketing projects? Sure, sure. So in reality, there's not a lot of difference between capital projects, uh, capital expenditure projects and marketing projects. Um, the, the main difference is you may not be, um, you know, doing a lot within the area of procurement management, but otherwise there's still an, every, uh, all of the rest of the knowledge areas, you're going to be touching on um, maybe not cost management as much, but time management, certainly human resource management. If you're managing a team of people, maybe you're working with a software project team as well. Um, and then just this whole idea of harnessing power and understanding who needs to be responsible for what, when, and be held accountable to it. That is um, something that you can learn a lot about by studying for the PMP exam. Um, the criteria for whether or not you take the PMP, I would actually just, being a strategy girl, I would ask you what's the strategy for your life, for your career? Is your strategy to move up the ranks as a project manager, or are you wanting to pursue a PhD and become a professor or you know whatever other career path that you might pursue? If it doesn't have an awful lot to do with project management, if you're really more of a people management person, um, or you're really mainly a graphic designer, uh, studying for the PMP wouldn't hurt, but investing the $400 or $500 to get your PMP certification um, I'm not convinced that it would be worth your while unless it's something that you were personally attached to in terms of outcome. It's, it's a great thing. In fact, I don't know that you'd want to pursue a career in project management without it. It's, it's just sort of the expected thing in industry today. Yeah, great question here um, about uh, project management um, <laughs> in industry rather than, than education. Um, how do we educate leaders about the rules of successfully deploying projects and accountability and the timeline? Wow, <laughs> that's a great question. So, oh, it's it's challenging. I know it's challenging. And the, ev let me let me start with this. Every single organization has its own unique culture around communication with leadership. In fact, everything every single sub organization, every department has its own culture around communicating with management. So, not all to companies are the same, um, not all two colleges are the same, but I am familiar um, to a certain extent with the unique challenges that come with such a hierarchical organization as an academic um, institution. So in terms of project management, um, you know, if you think about it again in terms of who's accountable, who's got the authority, and who has the power, the reality is in a way you you have um, more ability to move in, um, to, to help guide these decisions in academia. And here's, here's what I mean. Um, when you're in academia, your managers have the ability, in, in many cases, the dean or your, 
your marketing department manager would be able to make a case to their superiors that this particular project isn't feasible because of the resources and then they need to ask for additional resources or ask for an extension on the timeline. So one really big difference that I've seen between corporate and, um, and academia is that in corporate, timeline is usually not a movable constraint. In academia, often the costs and the quality of, of and product are adjusted in order to, um, I'm sorry, the time is adjusted in order to bring in a good quality product. So I'm not sure that there's a huge difference in the way that you would communicate with your management. Um, it would still be a conversation like, you know, you've asked me to get this project done within this particular amount of time, and I want to complete it with the quality that you've requested and within the cost constraints that we have to deal with. So now that I realize that there are going to be challenges to getting to that end date and the time frame that we expected, I need, I need you to step in with additional resources or a reduction in the level of quality that you expect from it or an extension of the timeline. But in project management, this is known as the three-legged stool, quality, time, and cost. You can have two, but you can't have all three. So if you want me to increase my quality, give me more money or extend my timeline. If you want me to do it faster, reduce the quality of the product that you want or increase the cost that you're allowing me to spend so that I can bear more resources against that timeline. And really that, that is, its, um, is the same across all industries and across all projects. And, and your managers intuitively, if not formally, understand that those are the constraints that they put you under and they're responsible more than you are for managing those constraints. Um, in terms of academia, you know, I'm not sure if I answered that question. If, if you need more clarification about academia, maybe you could resubmit. But in a way, it's not really that much different. Yeah. Great questions, everybody. Uh, thank you for attending today. Uh, we really appreciate uh, you guys uh, sitting in with us. And thank you to Joy for, uh, for putting this on for us. Lots and lots of great questions that we weren't able to get to. If I didn't answer your question, please uh, send me an email directly. Um, like I said, this uh, recording of this broadcast or this webinar will be out to uh, all attendees uh, here soon. So uh, thanks again, and uh, we look forward to seeing you on our next webinar uh, or possibly at our conference here coming up. So thank you very much and have a great day. Mm -hmm.